on November 18th of 1978 occurred one of the most tragic events among citizens of the United States. In fact, it was the greatest single day of loss of life of citizens outside of war until September 11th, 2001. Over 900 people, including 304 children, were killed that day. Most of them killed themselves following the false teachings of Jim Jones. Some of you may have remembered those tragic events. There were some who tried to escape. They were shot and killed. There were others who refused and they were injected with cyanide. The others who willingly participated took something called flavor aid laced with cyanide. They knew what they were doing. The People's Temple was the name of the religious movement that was founded by Jones in 1954. He actually started out as a Methodist youth minister, but grew frustrated with the restrictions of organized, institutionalized, denominational religion, namely that he wasn't becoming popular enough and broke away. He began to notice that in that day, there began to be a great movement of faith healers, and many of them were simultaneously also false teachers. He saw the crowds that it gathered began to do the same. He garnered some followers on the West Coast and instructed them in the process to actually fake being healed. There was in a lot of ways to actually test whether or not people had been healed of cancer and certain blood diseases, but nonetheless they did and crowds began to gather around his teachings. As time moved on, and he began to get more of a crowd, he began to study communism, especially related out of areas in South America, Central America, like Cuba. And so as he began to study, he began to find there to be a lot of synergy between that and his false teaching. Basically, when you begin to get a crowd, you feel like that you are being withheld and you need more attention, then you're going to find something that gives you more authority. And with him, he did find that within the system of communism. Authoritarianism, he really believed because he was the right person for the job, that he absolutely was the one to set up a system that would be new and be subversive both to government but also clearly to Scripture. Jones claimed that he had a vision. Part of that vision through the years was the destruction of Indianapolis and Chicago. I don't know why he hated Indy so much. But he did, and uh, eventually, though, he moved his ministry to Indianapolis because he found some traction among the people there on the northern side of the Midwest. He began then conflating and combining these elements of an apocalyptic destruction, a communistic authoritarian approach, a false teaching that would lead itself to false and fake healings, all mixed with some version of there being biblical truth riddled throughout it. However, over time, about a 10 or a dozen years later, he even began to say, in light of this new authoritarianism, this new vision, that the Bible itself was a black book that simply held no power. So he used the scriptures as long as it gave him power, gave him authority, and gave him a crowd, and gave him money. And then eventually, because, you know, frankly, if you're going to actually get into it, you may eventually see that what you're listening to is categorically false. He begins to actually deny the veracity and the authority of that very text. So he himself ends up becoming the interpretive text. That's what happens in false teaching and in authoritarianism is it's not proclaiming what is the truth, the best that we can surmise in light of the text itself. It is my version of the truth. It is my interpretation. Instead of believing in the infallibility or the inerrancy of Scripture, especially as it was written in the original manuscripts, and we just do our best to look at the context as we work through the text to say this is what Christ said. This is what the Old Testament prophets said and prophesied. This is what the apostles in the New Testament wrote down and taught because they experienced Christ for 40 days post-resurrection. We just simply try to open up the text and say this is what it appears to have meant, this is what it historically has meant throughout the church for the last 2,000 years, and then also then seek to say, look, even though it's difficult, it's still good for us today, and we submit to that authority. That's not what false teachers do. 
Jim Jones went on, and every time that there was an opportunity for him to leverage more people and more money, he would alter his beliefs. So actually, at one point in the early 60s, he was a, his ministry um, was adopted into the Disciples of Christ, which was a branch off in the early 20th century from the Churches of Christ. So you had Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ broke off for various reasons. Basically, at, back in the day, if you saw Christian as the name in the church, it most likely was a break off at Disciples of Christ Church. How they didn't see or be able to discern the greater error, I have no idea. But he stayed there many, many years. In fact, when he even got wind of the teaching that he was giving to his followers going against or even rumors of it going against disciples of Christ, he would soften that because he didn't want the leverage that he was gaining from being in a denomination for a season to be threatened. So he would change his beliefs accordingly. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's about his power, his authority, and his pockets. Throughout all of this, he began more and more painting himself as the only figure that could deliver people from the coming destruction in Indiana, in Indiana and Indianapolis in particular, and Chicago. He kept saying he kept having this vision over and over again, and it was just going to be what he called the birth pangs of the destruction, the nuclear war that was coming for all. And so you need to understand something that's, that's in the midst of this. You don't have to go all the way to the ends that we have talked about with Jim Jones. You need to understand, though, that there are markers. There are ways to recognize these people. You don't have to wait until there have been mass suicides or later on the Branch Davidians or Heaven's Gate or others that many times have said there is a threat and when someone says, I am your only way out, you need to take caution. And I will speak plainly to you, that includes all spheres of life. Anytime that you have someone that is likened to a Christ figure to deliver you in this world, you are susceptible to the false teaching that could come in and through people just like that. And guys, they come from church and they come from the political sphere especially. Especially in the day and age of uh, social media, we are able to see more and more how people liken certain figures to Christ, our deliverer. Even if those people themselves may not have the brazen, you know, gumption to say that about themselves, they certainly don't do anything to quell such things when it garners for them more power, more authority, more governance. These are marks of false teachers. In 1968, um, stemming from that um, integration into the Disciples of Christ Church, he began the slow process of refuting Orthodox Christianity and replacing it with his own centralization of his own authority, his own view of communism, and his own view of himself being a Messiah figure. Eventually, it led to what he called the Kingdom Commune in Guyana, and they named the area Jonestown. And it was there that this tragic event occurred 10 years later in 1978. It's where we get the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid. You know, sometimes we can be a little forgiving of our world, or at least more patient with our world, for saying such negative things about religious leaders and the church. Because the church, whether false teachers in doctrine or false teachers in practice, Meaning maybe they believe and say the right things, but they are ethically doing things that are counter to that. And that's a form of false teaching. Maybe we can be a little patient with the world for adopting things like don't drink the Kool-Aid to mean don't go there, don't participate in something that's only going to lead to your destruction. Don't follow what this one person is saying. You are blind and deaf because on the outside looking in, you just can't imagine what in the world could lead a group of people to drink something they know is going to kill them? What do they have to believe along the way to not see how errant, how foolish, how ridiculous this is? But here's what we have to understand. Just as the nature of such terrible and tragic events can happen, and it's not just the group dynamics of, of, of uh, you know, massive brainwashing or anything like that, although I'm sure there are those psychological effects. What we have to understand is that Peter is giving a warning in chapter 2 about false teachers, and he's also now giving us clear ways to recognize false teaching when it's in our midst. 
He would not say this if we were not susceptible to being led into falsehood. Even the church. He wouldn't give a warning if it was meaningless. He is giving it because when we are going through difficulty and tragedy, and if you're not going through that, then you have to create an environment where it is. So, for instance, you have to say there's going to be a nuclear blast in Indianapolis and Chicago. It's coming. And then you can claim that every single earthquake is part of your prediction. We know what the scriptures say. There will be the birth pangs before Christ returns. Of course, there will be wars and rumors of wars. There always have been. There is that debate of do we, are, is it happening more or do we just know more because of the speed of information and technology? But the fact is, is that anytime someone starts to say this is going to occur and then say this is part of my vision and then say, if you don't follow me, this is doomed. And when someone says, don't drink the Kool-Aid, they are trying to give you a warning, even if it's not lucid. They're just using the phrase, but it comes from this tragic event. In fact, an interesting angle on this commercially is Kool-Aid had a really bad PR problem because it wasn't Kool-Aid actually after this. That was the, uh, the mix. It was a thing called Flavor Aid. But no one says don't drink the Flavor Aid. I don't even know what Flavor Aid is. Wasn't around, didn't stick around. Probably know why, but there was no way. And, and I feel, you kind of feel bad for the company because Kool-Aid had a massive marketing problem on their hands. I, I can only imagine if social media existed at the time, what would they try to do? You would have to be extremely careful how to distance yourself from that without sounding cold. Wow. But it stuck with us after all these years. In fact, most people even use the phrase not even knowing it's derivative. It's all rooted in false teaching and the susceptibility of people who knew a little bit of something to buy in because fear and the lack of the authority of Scripture and the evidence of authority of someone you see which is contrary to faith and setting them up as a Messiah figure, we are susceptible for that cult of personality. And people on the outside say, I don't understand how you can't see it. Second Peter chapter 2, starting in the middle of verse 10. Please turn there if you would. Second Peter chapter 2, in the middle of verse 10. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter, dis- of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. 
Admittedly, it's not the most uplifting passage that we've ever preached, but we're going to preach it. We're going to listen and respond accordingly. Let's go to the Lord now and ask for help. God, we do pray that you would help us to receive in the way that you originally intended, Holy Spirit, for this to be breathed out through Peter to those in Asia Minor. That we would receive this truth, that we would respond to this truth, and that this would produce and bear the fruit that you desire for it to bear in the lives of both believers, but also unbelievers. Perhaps to realize that they have been following a falsehood. Or some who falsely claim to be believers, only to realize that they are adopting false practices, only to give evidence of what their real nature is, which is lost. Holy Spirit, we ask you to convict where conviction is needed to give comfort. Lord, some have, have children and others who have walked away from the truth and they have followed falsehood one way or the other. I pray that you would give them both comfort and patience, but also an endurance and even a boldness to pray and to even speak in the appropriate time and manner the truth and call people to repentance, even their loved ones. Father, we thank you for your mercies to us. May it be shown to us now as we look at this difficult passage. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to look at just a couple of things related to false teachers. And really, it's for the purpose of us to recognize false teaching when it's occurring. It's also for us to recognize that in the midst of some of our greatest difficult circumstances, that is really when we are susceptible to listen to something that is not necessarily true. And also to understand that when culture and society is going through such, they are going to have their own reasons for why they don't believe in Christianity. And all we can do is continue to be faithful. So really, there's kind of this side door entrance into encouragement through this text to go, look, be encouraged because the truth will win out. We should not be surprised at what is happening. We should not be surprised at the falsehood. Truth will win out in the end. We simply need to be faithful and steady. So with that, we're going to look at the nature of false teachers and the nature of the work of the false teachers. So first of all, at the second half of verse 10 through 13, what we see there is really the, the speech. What is the nature of their speech? What, what do they talk like? What are they doing? Well, you see this when he begins, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. Basically, he speaks of the brazen lack of respect and authority for spiritual entities. To submit to the fact that there are those and there are those in creation and others that are stronger and mightier than you. There's basically no humility at all. None. So they're constantly speaking in this arrogant fashion that basically sets themselves up to say, nothing can really harm me because nothing is above me. That literally is in their speech and it's going to come through. It's going to come through. And again, I would say that this is especially true for us to be cautious when it comes to anyone that claims to be speaking biblical religious truth. But I would also say there are corollaries just out there in the world that would also be good for you to, to understand and embrace that it's not good to follow people who continually think that they are above everyone else. You can dismiss whatever you want to, but at the end of the day, they are setting themselves up to be the only one that can deliver you from whatever. It's deception. They go on and it says, but these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. So they are brazen and arrogant in their speech. They are blasphemous in their speech. So even, even though being arrogant and, <clears throat> and rejecting all other spiritual authorities is a form of blasphemy, they actually will formulate it 
with their speech. They will say things. And here's the real, I mean, the real basic definition of blasphemy is, is essentially this, attributing evil or sin to that which is holy. So when, you, when God says something is good or holy or true, and you say, no, that's false, that's blasphemy. So they are literally taking truth and they are turning it on its head. So they are really being satanic. So their blasphemy and their deceptions are going together. So they're always speaking out of arrogance. They're always speaking blasphemy. And they're always speaking some form of deception to bring or woo others in. And they revel in this. In fact, he notes they do this in the daytime. Scripture makes it clear that when people sin, they do it at night so they're not noticed. These people, why? Because they're not noticed by people who could actually bring upon them consequence. Not these guys. They are bold and they are brazen and they say whatever they want to because they literally believe no one is above them. And you know what? For a long stretch, it can actually look like that's just about true. Remember what we talked about last week? There's, there can be this frustration when injustice seems to flourish, where wickedness seems to continue to prosper. And we have to trust that God is perfect and knows how to judge. God is perfect and knows how to deliver the godly and his own people. We have to be patient and keep doing the right thing at the right time. Just regularly practicing the seven things that are mentioned in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. Be faithful regardless of what's going on around you, regardless of the attacks that come upon you, regardless of the flourishing of the wicked. And those who even speak falsehood, their day is coming. And it's not that you live hoping for their demise, even though that will be a relief. The fact is, it is glorifying and honoring to the Lord to simply do and live in a way that is pleasing to Him. Because there's an eternal kingdom going on. These guys are trying to build an earthly one, and it's only going to last for a flash. So their nature is their speech is filled with arrogance, it's filled with blasphemy, it's filled with deception. Also their gaze, where they set their eyes. Look at verse 14. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. I mean, it's literally exactly what it sounds like. They basically cannot look upon another without thinking lust-filled, adulterous, sexually illicit thoughts. They are constantly leveraging their power and their abilities to hopefully, whether you want to be as crass as saying to have a one-night stand or to gather as many to follow them and even let them do whatever they say is okay as possible. They literally cannot see past that. That is some, So when you hear false teachers, you can know that for a fact, this kind of lack of ethics and, and, and power motivation and manipulation is going on. But guys, I have to make a note here because false teachers, you know, we would probably recognize someone who is this brazen, who certainly is blaspheming, who is practicing immorality, but we have to understand something. False teaching, there's a bit of a scale. There's a bit of a spectrum. Some people can believe something orthodox and they can have the appearance of humility. But if they are false teachers, they are doing so in order to gain something of sinful pleasure. And then when you see that, you can know that there is something false teaching going on. When someone, even who may sound orthodox, but they are doing so and manipulating others to then gain some kind of sexual favor, you can know that they are some form of false teacher. And unless they repent, they are proving themselves to maybe perhaps even be non-Christian altogether. The key will be whether or not they repent. So please, even though we're talking about what I would think would be extremes that we perhaps would recognize in this person or these people being a whole picture of what's being spoken of here, we have to understand that you could still have the orthodoxy and still an appearance of humility, but you could still have the ethics of a false teacher and still technically be false. So basically you'll find that your ethics, your work, your speech, and your beliefs, they do all go together. 
But the three-legged stool of those three things all fall when one of them doesn't exist or is broken. And invariably, false teaching will prevail. They have lustful, adulterous gaze. They basically are looking to possess and own another. They cannot see past this view of some kind of slavery that they desire for themselves to use and leverage others for themselves. They entice unsteady souls. They are looking for those who are weak. I mean, I, I've seen this on that spectrum. Orthodox evangelical pastors, they begin counseling widows, young widows. They begin to deal with someone going through divorce or perhaps someone who is in an extended season of singlehood and they give counsel. Look, if that has led to some kind of sexual relationship, I promise you that when they began the process, it was already in their view. It didn't just happen upon them. It wasn't just some mutual consent. If it culminates with that, their eyes were already looking through the gaze of adultery, even though they might have been orthodox in their actual beliefs. It's a form of false teaching. They exploit the weak, but for what purpose? Not just the pleasure, but he says they have, they have hearts trained in greed. Whatever seminary of false teaching that they've gone to, which is whatever experience they have found through much trial and error without being caught, that at the end of it, it is really about greed. It is about financial advancement. It is about that kind of making heaven on earth for themselves and really essentially just setting up a very hellish destruction. Basically, you can follow the money trail. You will find sexual immorality and you will find that their eyes are always filled with sin. I remember in college, I interviewed a very popular, at the time, this is a long time ago, uh, it was late 80s, early 90s, and um, I was doing an interview. Um, I was writing for a, a publication. Um, it was a college publication, but I wanted to do an interview of this guy that was a fantastic preacher. In fact, he had been a preacher at the church where I grew up in at one point, and wow, he was phenomenal. But he had had an affair, and he had left his wife, and his life was in turmoil. And now he was like the marketing director of some company. So I will never forget going into um, his office. And even at the time, and the guy was, you know, he, he seemed really old to me, like in his 40s at the time. And um, his office was filled with... Um, yeah, you, you would have thought you walked into a particular type of restaurant that your wife would kill you if she, if she ever found uh, that napkin in your backpack or something like that. I mean, it, it, it just, it was, it was all young women that were not appropriately dressed. And basically, when someone's surrounding themselves with such, you know that something's just not right. Eyes filled with adultery, insatiable for sin. At some point, you can't even hide it. So their speech is marked with this brazen despising of authority, this blasphemy, this deception. Their gaze is filled with lust, and they look for the weak. They look for their gain. And there's a reason that they are then described in this way, starting in verse 15, that their, the nature of their aim is this. It says, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. If you look back up in verse 12, it says, but these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. All of this, 12 through 16, really speaks of the nature of beasts of the field. Animals. These false teachers are very animalistic. You don't have to channel flip very far to find that those lions that prowl, they look for the weak. They look for their gain. 
It's very just instinctive. It's animalistic in its response. What is right is what feels good. What is right is what gains you more. It doesn't give consideration for how it's doing harm and damage to the victim. False teachers speak like this. They look like this because their aim is this very thing. In fact, I think the example of Balaam here is is very simple. I don't think it's anything very tricky. And that's simply this, is that Balaam had been given to false understanding, false teaching. He basically was doing what he was doing in prophecy to gain a buck, to get a dollar. And so what does the Lord do? It's almost ironic. He's acting like an animal and God literally puts a human voice inside of an animal to get his attention. I'm a victim of my age. So when I hear the story of Balaam, I can't unhear Eddie Murphy and Shrek. And I've ruined it now for you for the rest of your life. But the fact is, is that this idea of what are you doing, that God would use a beast with a human voice to give human reasoning and wisdom to a guy who's acting like an animal. And he's saying that's what these false teachers are like. They are just creatures. They are just going after what is good for them and they don't care about the victim. That is their nature in speech, their gaze, and even their aim. And it is riddled with this understanding of if you look at them and think of them as animals, as beasts, you'll get it just a little bit better. But the nature of their work is also in play here. Look at verse 17. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. What is he saying there? Well, the nature of their work, it's not just their nature in their speech, their nature in their gaze, like what they naturally look at and their natural pursuit, which is very animalistic. He's also saying that the nature of their work is this, it's empty. Jude actually makes a reference of being basically a waterless cloud. And we know that Peter is pulling some of this imagery from Jude. But this idea that it is basically, it promises something, but it's actually very empty in the end. Promises will be made, but it will be empty. The only one that's going to be satisfied is the person speaking the falsehood. So a widow gets on TV. She hears that perhaps her loneliness will be assuaged if this guy prays for them, but she has to send in a few bucks first from her retirement promises have been made she's going to be no less lonely because she's putting her hopes somewhere else other than the Lord she's bought into this empty lie in fact if you flip over just a few pages past the Johns and look at Jude verses 12 and 13 you'll see this these are hidden reefs at your love feasts As they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. (laughs) We're actually going to work through Jude at some point, and this phrase could not double down more on just how useless these people are. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. The nature of their work is empty. Whatever the promises are, I promise you it will not lead you to anything of fulfillment. It will give the appearance of wisdom, but it will be completely devoid of teaching. They will boast in self, but nothing really substantive. It will be an endless loop. It's not unlike lust. It feels good for a moment, then you feel terrible, but you have to keep those movements going. You have to keep the lust moving to actually have any length of season at all of distraction or relief. And it's only building up and adding to your conviction and your guilt and shame. But that's the nature of sin. Feels good for a bit, but you have to keep doing it. Any kind of addiction is built on this premise. The same thing is happening here. These guys will teach about something promising. It will be empty, but they keep doing it. They keep moving. It's a shell game. 
keep moving it around. But it's in, inevitably, if you really remove all the distractions, it's all about them. And it's all about giving them money. It's all about following them and their interpretation rather than the actual truth. And it will lead to emptiness, even what the writer says is destruction. That's the nature of their work. But also look at verse 19. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Not only is the nature of their work empty, it's also enslavement. It's enslavement. They, they teach and preach the promise of some kind of freedom, some kind of deliverance from probably, in light of the context, suffering. Some kind of relief from suffering. They're promising this. It's snake oil. But that they can get out of town before anyone catches them. They will speak of this work, but it's basically enslavement. Is it possible that they're talking about even the final judgment? Don't worry about the final judgment. It doesn't exist because we know when we get to chapter 3 that Peter is saying, no, Christ is going to return. They're actually saying he's not. So if, you're, if a false teacher then comes and says, don't worry about a, false, about a return of Christ, it's, it's not real. What are you doing? You're promising freedom from fear of judgment. This is what any false teacher will do. They will try to give you a sense of freedom, but in the end, it is going to lead to enslavement. And if you've not broken away in this life, you will be enslaved for eternity in a very real place called hell. That eternal relief will always lead to their temporal establishment of heaven. A false teacher's diminishing and falsely teaching that you can have eternal relief by not worrying about any judgment whatsoever. There's no accountability. That always is designed for that false teacher's temporal establishment of their own version of heaven. Meaning if you're telling them what they want to hear, they will keep giving you money. You will keep surrounding yourself with women because the money is there. I don't think I meant that quite the way that I, I said it for all women everywhere. I just mean what they're looking for, that kind of woman. Because their gaze is always fixed on whatever in the end will give them pleasure. And the nature of this at the end is just a complete and utter waste. It's empty, it's enslavement, and it's completely wasteful. Look at verse 20. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. Now, we have to think about what he had said earlier in the chapter to help us understand the nature of this. If you remember when we were earlier in the chapter talking about that they deny even the master who bought them, that we looked at various interpretations or approaches to this. And because of context, even though it sounds like you can lose salvation, there's too many texts that are clearly stating you cannot lose what Christ has purchased on your behalf. You cannot undo his fingers wrapped around you. Just go to John 6, go to John 10, go to any number of passages, go to Ephesians chapter 1. There's any number of passages that confirm that once we are his, we are always his, if we are truly his though. With the warnings in Hebrews, and there's five of them, and also with the warnings that we have here, what we see is, boy, you can get really close, look, smell, taste like a believer to other people and still be lost. What happens? In the end, the nature wins out. That's what he's saying. Because when he goes on to say this, he gives this imagery. When he says it would have been better for them to have not known the way basically of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back. And he says what the true proverb has said, the dog returns to its own vomit. What he's saying is, you know, eventually if that's what happens, they are only proving their nature of, again, using this animalistic terminology, that they have not been truly born again, ever. They claimed it, but then when things got difficult, they found a better way. They grew impatient, and basically that's part of the mark of a true believer is perseverance of the saints or preservation of the saints, the Spirit of God who is 
guaranteed and deposited into us as believers causes us, I'm not saying we'll be perfect, but I'm saying over the long haul, for the true believer, there will be a sustenance, there will be a preservation, even through difficulty, we will resist, or even if we have failed for a season, we will confess our sin of giving in to false teaching, but we will endure in the end. Honestly, sometimes people go away for a long time and they don't come back until the very end. That's not for us to judge, but I'm just saying for those that we can actually see and say, as another human to another human, Boy, the testimony of their life appears to be that of an actual true believer. They persevere to the end. For those that did not, we are left with questions. For those that have prodigal children, you can only pray and hope and speak kindly and weep continuously, hoping that whatever their return is, it is either genuine conversion or it is a return to the Christ that they have truly known. I would just encourage you not to try to make a declaration one way or the other. Just pray for their restoration. Whatever that means, the Spirit of God, I pray, will make it clear to you all in the end. But the fact is, is that everything they do is waste. It was a waste for them to even know the truth because now they've known it. But why does he say it would have been better? It's not just that he's saying it was better for them. I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about false teaching. It would have been better for everyone else if these guys did not know a thing about the gospel because they are actually able to implement it into their false teaching. They are able to say just enough to woo and deceive those in the church to believe what they're saying. It would have been better had they only been given completely to pagan ideologies than to just know a little bit only then to turn because they have deceived and they've drawn many away. And he says, look, what's happening is that they're just showing you their real nature, their real stripes. They are returning to the vomit like a dog was to continue that metaphor of them being animals. He's saying it is what it is what it is. Now, we can recognize false teachers by their nature, in their speech, the things they look at, the the jokes that they make, what it always is referring to. Um, You can also see it in what their aim is, what it sounds like their real goal is. You can sniff it out a little bit. You can also see it in the nature of their work when they give empty promises and and they, they basically are speaking about things that deny that there's any accountability or judgment coming and only it's going to lead to enslavement to a particular philosophy or that particular person like Jim Jones in Guyana. I promise you freedom and deliverance if you follow me because there's going to be all this destruction. But that only led to their enslavement, even their physical and unfortunately probably for most, if not all, eternal destruction. Now this is juxtaposed though to what Peter has already said as being the teaching of truth tellers, the apostles, reflecting that of Christ. We don't have time to go into a point-by-point comparison, but just glance back at chapter 1. Just as we close, I want you to see how this is so contrary. In verse 16, he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The truth tellers are saying there is another authority. They call him Lord and Master. Remember in the speech of a false teacher, they are denying the authority of any entity. The apostles are saying, no, we have an authority and that authority is Christ. The false teachers will say whatever deceives so that their sensuality and their false practices are built up. The apostles are saying, we simply told what we saw. And they go later and they say, we ourselves heard this very voice, verse 18, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. So what is that saying? They're submitting to the holy word of God and they're not saying it's more important now or what we saw is better. He's just simply saying, we've now seen it fulfilled. We've seen what was in the Old Testament. So they are continuing to submit themselves to the authority of God's word. Whereas people like Jim Jones and other false teachers, they will decry any kind of submission to the authority of what Jones called the dead black book. Mine's red, but it's very alive. It's living and active. But the apostles didn't do that. They submitted to the authority of the prophetic word. And then the authority of Christ as they heard God say, this is the one. He is the one. 
The truth tellers will point to someone else. False teachers point to themselves. But I will say this, truth tellers, the only other that they point to is Christ. Certainly there are false teachers who point to others, but there are other false teachers. There are others like Joseph Smith and other false teachers who claim to have a new revelation from God. These guys are speaking of the revelation that came through what was known as the scripture and fulfilled in the person of Christ whom they saw and they are simply bearing witness to. So their belief, their speech, even their work and their ethics, if you flip over to the end of the chapter or close to um, in verse 14 of chapter three, he says, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So whereas the false teachers are saying, oh, let me, let me give you freedom right here and right now. Let me give you that freedom. There is no judgment. There's no responsibility. Truth tellers are saying, oh, he is coming. And what that should provoke in you, not as if you can earn it yourself, but simply in light of that, live out freely that you don't have to sin. It's completely contrary. When you believe the truth of the return of Christ... It should provoke in you, not the arrogance of, well, you know how the puzzle pieces fit together. No, it should provoke in you a desire for holy living, an urgency to share your faith. This is what truth tellers do. So guys, recognize the false, but please remember in the process, Peter was not encouraging the church to be built up in their mutual enemy. He started with chapter 1, which is all unifying language about what it means when we are all rallied around the truth of the gospel. You will recognize anti-gospel the better you know actual gospel. Too many people live their lives simply being angry at what they know they're supposed to hate instead of actually loving and having affection for what is true. Peter, I think, has made it clear Follow the truth, know the truth, but do recognize and understand there will be false teachers come in. But I think part of him saying to recognize it is, is yes, not to fall prey, but I think it's also to not be discouraged because it's going to happen. There will be those until the Lord comes that are going to speak falsely and make empty promises. Don't be too discouraged, church. Keep doing your thing. You be you, but that is not like the world necessarily means it. It's according to chapter one. You be the you that God has made you to be. Don't be discouraged. Keep enduring because he is going to come back. And that is the truth. So guys, if that's the truth and we believe that it is, then what's your response to that? As a Christian, it should be. Not being prey to getting too worked up about political entities rising and falling doesn't mean be a complete pacifist, but it does mean don't put an eternal weight of glory on any candidate or any kind of system or anything else because your hope is not here. So pray, vote, but man, please, please have a greater burden for the lost than you do for I'm not going to get into pejorative terms, but whatever pejorative term or angry term that you have for that other side. Be burdened for the lost. Be invigorated to live a holy and good life because the Lord is coming back. Political parties, they're going to rise and fall. Whole countries and nations rise and fall. But that's not someone claiming doom. That's just simply saying the Lord is going to come back. These are those birth pangs. I've had no vision of apocalypse or nuclear destruction. I just know what the text says. And my hope lies in this. This ain't my home. This is not my home. And part of gathering as a church each week is to remind ourselves of that very fact so that we don't become wildly discouraged And nor do we find ourselves wrongfully pursuing, trying to make it more like heaven. So let's be unified in our faith. Let's be unified in the gospel as we point to Christ. And in our behavior, as we 
are submitting to authorities around us, including the Word of God. Not any one person at all. I'm an under-shepherd. There's only one chief shepherd, and that's Christ in the church. As we do that mutually, we're reminding each other of the fact that we're all sojourners. And we'll be able to sniff out when people are saying something that's false. And we'll say, you know what? Not a good idea. Don't listen to that. Whether for discouragement or actually buying in, don't do it. Let's keep worshiping him, following him together. And look, I will say this, whether you're watching online or in here, if you do not really rest in the fact that Christ and Christ alone is the truth, is the fulfillment of all of Scripture, and that all of that Scripture has been pointing to the person of Christ, that you cannot save yourself, you cannot be freed from the slavery of sin on your own, by your own behavior or your own set of beliefs, you have to believe only in the one who has actually truly freed you, and that would be Christ, who lived the perfect life that you are supposed to live, but you cannot, and nor have any of us. And he died the penalty that every person who sins deserves, which is death. And if you believe that Christ has both lived and died for you in your place, but also that he rose from the dead so that there is nothing else to be done to deliver you, to keep all those promises, if you believe on him and believe that about him for you, then you're one of his own. Take joy in that. But you will not necessarily prosper in this world. You might. But if you do, it's because he's given you a gift to help foster the gospel going forward until he comes it's not to build up your own kingdom but for many and probably most of us there's going to be struggle there's going to be difficulty there's going to be injury and persecution and sickness we're going to struggle financially but whatever the case is we simply know our trust lies elsewhere we aren't given to empty promises so trust and believe in christ alone don't stop doing just that church And again, if you don't know Christ, please talk to one of us before you leave. We'd love to visit with you about what it means to know him above all others. Let's pray. God, we want to thank you for your mercies to us that what a tough passage that is so discouraging if we don't remember it in light of this being a whole letter. There's already been fantastic, encouraging instruction given. But as we go week to week, like we do, we go at such a a pace that at times we forget that we've already been saturated with gospel telling as we look at passages like this that are very difficult. But God, we do acknowledge the truth that there will be false teachers among us. And they will will have the guise of, of religion or they will be in politics and there will be religious terminologies attached to them. But God, we need to recognize false teaching for what it is and it's to be rejected. And God, in that we are to also then embrace the fact that Christ and Christ alone delivers no one else and you've already done the work. So God, I pray that our burden would lie in this, that we believe the truth, that by your spirit we preserve in understanding and holding to that truth that we take the hits as they come, that we remain faithful regardless of those hits, and that we want to encourage holy living and gospel telling until Christ comes back, plain and simple. Lord, may that mark us above all else. May that be our nature and the nature of our work as opposed to those who are false. God, I pray that you'd expose false teachers. I pray that you would root them out where churches perhaps are maybe even in our area, are being uh, taught falsely. Maybe they're starting to believe some false things. There are false teachers under false monikers of ministry like the rod of iron ministry. God, I pray that you would expose it for what it is to be cultic and false, and I pray that you would shut it down in the name of Christ. I pray, God, that you would help us to discern that just because someone throws the name of Jesus around doesn't mean there's anything biblical or Christ-like about what they say or what they do. Give us discernment. Help us to love and protect one another. And Lord, the main thing is help us to follow you and glorify your name regardless of all that that's going on around us, trusting that the Spirit of God will prevail over falsehood and deception. The gates of hell will not prevail against your church. And in that, we glory you in you, and we sing. In Jesus' name, amen.